And we're live? Yep. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jared here at the Sacramento History Museum. We are currently open. Uh, today is our big opening day, and I'm here today to talk to you about men's fashion of the late Victorian era. So I don't know why the museum decided to choose me because I am not really the most fashionable person here at the museum. But late Victorian era doesn't change that much from the early Victorian era in regards to patterns. Of course, there are some big changes that do happen uh, towards the mid to late 19th century. Of course, the French fly comes in fashion, no longer are pants broad falls where you button across the top and it just flaps down. The French fly is kind of like the button fly of today. And also you start to see a patent that was issued to uh, Levi Strauss in 1873 who patented ri riveted denim pants that we know today as blue jeans. So that's something that big that happens towards the late Victorian era, especially here in California as Levi Strauss was uh, had his uh, business in San Francisco. But the rest of the 19th century becomes very bleak in regards to color for uh, for men as it is the age of the Industrial Revolution people started to wear more darker colors, especially black suits, probably so it doesn't show that much uh, coal ash or smoke on their clothing from all the uh, steam engines and coal burning uh, at different factories. But I really wanted to talk to you today about color because color was big. Look at my shirt that I'm wearing. This is a standard pattern that would have been available by the 1840s. Uh, just to recap with you from last week, uh, coarse cotton becomes the cash crop in the South by the early 1800s after the invention of the cotton gin in 1793 by Eli Whitney. And the unfortunate byproduct of the invention of the the cotton gin is that cotton was able to be grown farther inland in the south which expanded the slave trade where enslaved people from Africa were brought farther inland all the way to Texas and cotton became the major crop and that cotton was being exported to the north in these early textile factories which, as I shown you last week, these early textile factories during the market revolution started to make mass quantities of fabrics. And the dyeing of those fabrics becomes very popular. Of course, you, got your, you have a white fabric that comes off of these looms, but how did they get color? Now, a lot of people, at, uh, if they were doing it at home, might be a little bit different than what was happening in factories. The, probably the most prominent color of the time was blue. And that comes from indigo. And indigo was also a major crop as well in the South that involved enslaved workers uh, working in these fields and this is an illustration from the early 1800s of the processing of indigo to get the dye. The, the dye actually would come from the plant itself. It would be dried and ground and blue just was a very popular color because it was one of those permanent colors that didn't bleed very well and so that color stayed pretty permanent. It wouldn't fade as easily. Another popular color that comes about, and it was actually a very prominent color of the American West, was red. A lot of American fur trappers wore the color red uh, on their, for their capotes. A lot of Hudson's Bay Company blankets were made out of red. 
And the red dye actually comes from the cochineal bug. So this is the bug itself. This is an illustration uh, in a work from the early 1800s. And the bug is dried, and no, those are not raisins or anything like that. And once it is dried, it is then ground. And then you would uh, boil your fabrics in the cochineal uh, to get that very vibrant red color. And you're probably thinking to yourself, that's pretty disgusting. Uh, that's ground bugs for that red color, but don't worry. Cochineal is actually still used today in red food dyes and in lipstick. Uh, but red was incredibly popular. Uh, now with indigo and, uh, and red from the cochineal, you can get purple. So first your dyed fabric that's red, you could then dye it in indigo to get the purple color. And purple was a color that wasn't really something that the common person could wear until uh, the mid 1800s because it was very associated with royalty. But with the expansion of fabrics, uh, you started to see more people wearing purple and lots of colors were available. Now from yellow, there's lots of different ways. There is the you can do this at home, and I've, I've done this before. Uh, you could make a yellow dye from onion skins, uh, but a lot of actually from uh, the bark of a black oak tree would be used for a yellow color. And I forgot to mention as well that with the yellow color, with another uh, material that you can get red from, which is the matter root, Mixing those, you can get orange, a nice bright orange, because look at my shirt. I mean, nothing is, nothing is more bright orange at this time than, than this fabric itself. It's a little bit faded, folks. Uh, I, I've worked many a times in this, so it has faded uh, over the years. Uh, of course, the dye color black uh, could be from a variety of different options, logwood, uh, walnut skins, you could get a uh, black color. Green though was probably one of the most dangerous uh, colors actually. And it was considered the uh, deadly uh, color of them all because you can get a green dye from a variety of different plants that are dried, but the green did not really stick. But in by the 18, in 1814, you saw the uh, patented of a nice, vibrant green color that became incredibly popular. Everybody wanted green. They wanted. They started to have the the rooms in their house painted green. It was pretty expensive too, but that green involved arsenic, and so it was considered. Here we have. Uh, the the uh, dance the dance with uh, the dead, which is this deadly fabric that people uh, wore. They they no matter the health concerns, no matter how it made you ill, they still wore green. And uh, these are just is some of the examples of how they got color at this time. Now that's the color itself. How do you get what I'm wearing. So you have a variety of different prints at this time. Calicos and paisleys uh, came, uh, been around for hundreds and hundreds of years from the Kashmir region in India. And it became very popular when they, with the East India trade for trading these fabrics uh, and brought, brought them to Europe and they became incredibly popular. But with the market revolution, you started to not have these uh, homespun fabrics printed with blocks. And I mean, they would make the design with a block and stamp it, just like uh, you might 
you know, use regular stamps for. Or say, if you were to see our, our printing presses down there, that you started to see some origins of woodcuts with these patterns. But how do you start making mass quantities of those? And that's what really spurs during this market revolution that not only do you have these looms making these fabrics, you started to start sending those finished fabrics through a rolling press that had all the different designs on it. So here is an example of one of those rollers. And that's how they would start to print these calico on these, on these fabrics and it just became all the rage. And with each individual color, now I'm lucky to have only three colors on here. We have the blue, the lime green, and there's a little tinge of orange inside there. That would mean that it would go through the press three times in order to print this. So with each separate color on the pattern became more expensive because it meant that it had to go through the press that many times, which was very unlike if you have something that is just stripes or plaid. That's just changing out the, the string uh, on, on the loom. This rolling of the print on a fabric is what really made things expensive. And by the late 1800s, you started to see prints that had at least five different colors on them. So we're talking something that was quite valuable. Now, what about here in California? So here I have, it's a transcribed copy from John Sinclair, who was a worker at, at uh, Rancho Del Paso. He, uh, Rancho Del Paso was just across the American River from New Helvetia, owned by John Sutter. And uh, John Sinclair was the all-call day of the Sacramento District in 1847, and he was the all-call day uh, during the rescue of the Donner Party. And Edward Kern had paid workers to rescue the Donner Party, and in with all these children that were, uh, were rescued, there was a lot of materials left around out there and they actually held an auction to raise money to, uh, to give money to the children so they could survive essentially after they were rescued. But we have in these letters that they were holding an auction at Sutter's Fort and selling calico fabrics that they had found in order to raise money for the Donner children. But we also have this letter dated February 19th, 1847. Uh, Sinclair is writing to Edward Kern that they were planning on bringing fabric to uh, the women uh, up at Donner Lake because they assumed that maybe they would need fabrics to repair their clothing and everything. And it was these fabrics, these calico fabrics were about 75 cents a vara. A vara is about 32.9 inches. But he says that he has, uh, the, that's, the very, that's the very nice calico. He also has calico that were worth about 50 cents, but nobody would wear that. So there's clearly starts to be some different variations of calico some people wanted. A lot of calicos that nobody wanted at all that maybe it was not fashionable anymore. So I hope that you, this has interested you to learn more about clothing and fabrics. And it's something that is very popular amongst our volunteers, especially as they choose their new dress that they wanna wear uh, for living history events as everybody wants to look the best as possible and have something that is as is, is elaborate and colorful as possible. And all of these fabrics takes a, takes a lot of research and they are documented in these pattern books that you could find online. So if you are interested in learning more about color and fabrics, 
check out. There's lots of different books online. And then if you're interested in fashion trends over the 1800s, check out our previous videos that we have uh, done for our Facebook Lives on Friday and on Mondays this month. Uh, next Monday, we are going to be highlighting the Edwardian period, which is the early 1900s. Zoe is going to discuss the fashion of the time for women and how a lot of these, those fashions were very popular amongst uh, suffragettes and, the, and women involved in the suffrage movement. movement. And uh, I hope that you uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram, follow us on TikTok as well as we are nearing 800,000 followers. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, we are now open. So I hope you come and visit us here at the Sacramento History Museum. Uh, we are open from uh, Tuesday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 5 o'clock, last admission at 4.30. And we would just love to have you come down and say hi to us and see our brand new exhibit here Californian print uh, items from the Eleanor McClatchy collection. I hope you all have a great rest of your day and have a good weekend. Bye everybody.